I know you were wondering what we'd be talking about today, but worry no more. I've got just the thing. Ah. Uh... I'm Vince. And I'm Claire. And this is Friends, Friends of, of Legend. Legend. Welcome to Friends of Legend, a podcast where we seek to understand and subsequently befriend various mythical creatures. We've noticed there's a lot of misunderstanding and fear surrounding a lot of our magical babies in the world, and we thought that we would do our part in this podcast, spreading awareness of these creatures so that we can live in harmony with them. And there's already enough scary stuff going on in the world right now, so if we can make new friends of a legendary proportion... Then the time is now. So Vince, we have been together as a couple, we're a couple, um, for almost five years. And one of the first things that I noticed about you was that you were, you were a bit nerdy like me. And, and something that a lot of nerds have in common is that we, we have an affinity for the fantastical. Right? It's true. So, magical animals, magical creatures have a lot to do with that. What, what has your, your lifelong experience been? I mean, I don't know whether this counts, but I think it, it probably started with Pokemon. Uh, those, those wonderful little pocket boys. I think that counts. Um, I dove deep into that because that exploded when I was a kid and it led me down all sorts of paths. Uh, including, you know, actual cultural myths and fantasy and sci-fi stories. And then as I got older to Dungeons and Dragons, which is a lot of where my understanding of the fantastic world comes from now. Right. Yes. Um, that makes perfect sense. To me, I, I was raised in a household with a lot of um, sort of motifs of fantastical creatures um my mom always had a big thing for fairies she had paintings all over the house of fairies and we read books about dragons like do you know the popcorn dragon oh yes you've read it to me oh that's right um the popcorn dragon is a really sweet children's book where this this sweetheart of a dragon uses his fire breath to Pop popcorn for everyone because he doesn't want to use his powers for harm. And I think that's sort of the, the idea that we would like to share with everyone. We want to share that you don't have to be afraid of dragons. You don't have to be afraid of ghouls. You don't have to be, you don't have to, you know, just automatically think that the creatures of the deep are are gross and scary and we want to we want to be friends with everyone you know i think the world would be a better place if if we were able to be on the good side of all all the babies out there <laughs> i definitely think that both beast and man could benefit from a little bit of companionship definitely so i'm so excited to begin who is our new friend this week vince well, I thought we'd start with something that was already pretty near and dear to our hearts, and that is the gnome. Now, we have accepted a little bit of gnome culture into our lives. We like to think of ourselves as gnome-like. Yes. Uh, we certainly have a lot of gnome decor. We do. We have two gnomes outside of our apartment. Uh, they kind of watch over the the... The folks walking by and... The front and the back. The front and the back, yes. Um, we have a gnome on our, our second floor balcony of our apartment named Frederick. And he carries a little watering can and he watches over the garden. We have this adorable gnome hat that tops our, our small Christmas trees. 
mm-hmm. um, instead of a, a star. Don't forget about your car gnomes. Yes, I have. I've got these little friends that that are maybe about an inch high. With the turn of each season of the year, I I have a a different gnome um, that I stick on the dashboard of my car and. Like, right now it's spring, so I have, his name is Pollen, and he's carrying this big flower, and it's really cute. Um, whenever I'm stressed out, I look at my little gnome, and it makes me happy. It's a really comforting presence, definitely. And I know that the, <laughs> so I know the visual of a gnome is pretty iconic, but for those of you who may not be familiar, a gnome is a, a humanoid being, uh, about uh, half a foot to a foot high. Um, they're very easily recognized by the tall, pointy hats that the uh, the males wear, and their long beards and their colorful clothes. And the female gnomes wear uh, very simple yet elegant dresses, and they have braids and little wooden shoes. Right. And uh, you know the common the common idea of the gnome is hanging out in the forest or in a garden. But there are also gnomes that live underground, and there are gnomes that really? live in the mountains. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> and uh, perhaps most importantly to this podcast, there are gnomes that live in homes. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Awesome. So, my first question is, it's something that eats away at me. Why are gnome hats usually red? And why are they conical? Why are they pointy? So, we'll start with the conical shape first. Uh, it seems, as far as what I was able to tell, that the the shape and the size of the hat, the fact that the hat itself makes up a fair percentage of the gnome's height, is to distinguish themselves from other small folk. Because oh. for the untrained human eye, you might not necessarily know the difference between an elf or a dwarf or a pixie or a fairy or a gnome. Right. Or any of those those little beans. Right. Um... So it seems like that really sets them apart from the rest because you certainly don't see, uh, I mean, there's the, the Keebler elves, but that <laughs> that's more of a conflation on a human's part than actually representative of elf culture. The, the pointy hat is the territory of the gnome. I see. As far as the red, gnomes have different colored hats for different reasons. I think red is the most common because gnomes are nocturnal beings. Okay. And they're also secretive beings, and it is their belief and understanding that red is a harder color to see in the dark for <laughs> um, for human eyes than other colors. Okay, that makes sense. And you were saying that gnomes are often confused with um, with elves and dwarves, dwarves and, and, and pixies and trolls and right. all sorts of things. Right. So I, I was wondering, do gnomes have pointed ears like like? elves and pixies and whatnot it's hard to say um it might depend on where they come from or it might just be a sort of artifact of humans not really knowing the difference between elves and dwarves and gnomes and stuff and just kind of creating a a big old melting pot when they when they create images of gnomes right i I'd be willing to bet that there are certain areas of the world where gnomes have pointed ears. I'd say particularly gnomes of the British Isles. Okay. I guess. I also want to talk about two of the other colors that gnome hats can be. Gnome gnome hat colors can represent uh, jobs that a gnome has, similar to like the colors of a uniform in Star Trek. Okay. Or it can um, kind of identify the heraldry of a gnome's family similar to like a noble house okay um two colors that are representative of sort of a social status are yellow hat which gnomes wear before they come of age which for gnomes is about 40 years 40 40 years yeah at 40 they're considered gnome adults um and then they can get the the hat color of their choice or of their station i think pretty much all of them have a red hat that they wear if they're going to be out and about in the human world but okay yeah then the other important hat color is green if you see a gnome with a green hat that indicates that they are a protector of a forest or some sort of natural area oh very cool they're kind of like gnome druids in that respect so vince and i 
play Dungeons and Dragons in our our spare time. And uh, one of Vince's characters that he plays is a little gnome druid himself. Yep. And now that I'm kind of more keen on gnome lore, I might have to go and have him find a green hat to wear. Because I didn't know that when I first created the character. I think that sounds lovely. Uh, it would be great. So you were saying that there are gnomes that live inside your home. And we're not talking about garden gnomes. There, <laughs> There is a distinction which I will get into when we talk about the, the different areas of the world that gnomes come from. But yeah, there, there are gnomes that live inside the home. And there are also gnomes that live in a garden. Okay. So what, what do the gnomes that live inside homes do? Are... Are they living inside human homes? Is that what you're saying? So gnomes in general, are they, they do build their own homes and villages um, if they're living out in the forest or underground or even in your garden. But the gnomes that live inside human homes, these gnomes, um, they are native to continental Scandinavia. So that's oh. Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. And in those countries, they call them uh, Tomte Nise or Tomte Nise. Um, I know you're pretty familiar with the the Tomte Nise. Yes, there is a. Um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners have seen this in um, in places that sell Christmas decorations. The Tomte Nise iconically has a big, tall conical hat. Sometimes they're striped and decorated, and they've got this big old nose sticking out. And then they've got this great big bushy beard that just kind of covers the rest of their face. Uh, all you can see is the, is the little nose and then the little beard. And, and then they've got a little fat body at the bottom. So uh, we, we've got some of them at our house for Christmas time. They're, they're the cutest thing. Um, and, and that's, uh, it's spelled T-O-M-T-E. And then Nisa is N-I-S-S-E. So, so I, uh, I definitely suggest looking into those. Um, they're very precious. They're very precious. And that um, sort of cultural staple of Yuletide comes from the Scandinavian belief that Tomtenisa are either household helpers in the off season, or they are there to help old Saint Nick bring presents to worthy children. Like like the little Christmas elves. Yeah, very very similar to that. It's the Scandinavian version. They're a lot more gnome heavy. And if you have a Tom Denise in your home, which is pretty common even in urban areas, mm -hmm. uh, because the, the gnomes in Scandinavia are a lot less furtive, a lot more open to contact with humans, they'll live in your house, they'll do little chores for you, decorate your home with their little gnome treasures, Aww. as long as you keep them fed and happy. Now, okay. if you're not feeding them or if you're presenting them food that isn't very good, <laughs> uh, they're going to start wrecking your stuff. Oh, no. They're going to start breaking the wedding china, ripping the feathers out of your pillows. Oh, no. Um, things like that. They like being a part of human life. They like doing things for you. But only as long as they're being respected and treated well. Okay. Well, that makes sense. I feel the same way. I, I don't know that I would go about wrecking people's pillows, but um, I definitely understand where they're coming from. So what do gnomes like to eat and drink? Well, uh, I think it varies from place to place. But in general, gnomes are almost entirely vegan. Uh, the the oh. only one thing I could find that wasn't strictly speaking vegan that they eat is honey. Oh. Um, and they don't just eat it raw too. They have their own cuisine. They will prepare, cook, spice, um, their fruits and veggies. They particularly like root vegetables, especially the ones that live underground. They like their turnips and potatoes. And they also like their mushrooms when they're not building homes out of them. Aww. Um, another thing that I think is very interesting and endearing is that gnomes are fond of drink. Now they're not beer drinkers. That's more of a dwarf thing. Okay. Uh, they will prepare wine from berries. Oh, um, sounds really good. Like raspberries and strawberries. Uh, they'll make mead from the honey um, and little thimbles. Oh. And also, if you uh, if you find a particularly clever, uh, ingenious 
sort of society of gnomes. They might have their own distilling equipment. Wow. Which they make uh, spiced gin with, which I always like thinking uh, of a bunch of gnomes cramming like five juniper berries into a little still with some water. And Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Yeah, gnomes seem to be um, pretty pretty sophisticated. Oh, definitely. They're not... Uh... They're not primitive by any means. They, they're they certainly more close to nature and the earth than humans or perhaps elves or dwarves are. But um, they they have a very advanced culture and society. I think we could all learn something from the gnomes as far as uh, treating, treating the earth a little better than we do currently. Um, I agree. It doesn't seem particularly hard to do. For them, but there's also a lot of conveniences that we have that they don't have. And I think uh, Tomtis in particular are a little more urbane. Gotcha. Right. Um, now, what you were saying about gnome food and drink reminded me. I um, There's a, a an online game that I play called RuneScape. And I'm sure some of our listeners are, are familiar with it. But RuneScape has a lot of uh, sort of medieval and fantastical um, themes in it. And there's this village that you can go to where the gnomes there live in tree houses and they have their own little restaurant and you can get these fun cocktails that they they make strictly there and and they have their own, you know, toad crunchies and, and mushroom pies and whatnot and it's it's whimsical and it's definitely pretty evolved for for these these little friends that live in trees and they they know what they're doing they have their own systems and their own culture definitely so what what do you know of the gnomes that live in isolation from humans uh, you were saying that there are there are gnomes that live in mountains that's right so the gnomes generally speaking, can be found all over continental Europe. Um, And they can also be found in the British Isles, Iceland, and the Faroe Islands, which is uh, an island chain kind of uh, north of Scotland, south of Iceland. Right. Um, Most gnomes are going to live outside of the human sphere. They're going to live in forests. Gnomes in sort of central Europe, uh, like Germany and Switzerland, and also in the British Isles, are known to live underground, and they will do stoneworking and jewelry and fine metal craft and things like that, similar to similar to dwarves, but in their own way. And in fact, in Switzerland in the 16th century, gnomes were first um, sort of distinguished from other small folk by a uh, Swiss alchemist named Paracelsus. He huh. thought of gnomes as earth elementals, likely because they're so close to the ground. Um, and the word gnome comes from the Latin uh, genomos, which oh, means okay. earth dweller or of the earth. Huh. Um, so it seems like the that sort of understanding of gnomes puts them more uh, as sort of subterranean creatures. Whereas in other places, like in Scandinavia, other parts of Europe and uh, Ireland, uh as well as Iceland and the Faroes, they they live out in the plains or in the forests. Um, another sort of habitat that gnomes occupy that these have a very particular culture to them are the gnomes of Siberia. These live out in the the tundras and in the oh, mountains. Wow. These gnomes share a lot more in common with the sort of ancestral foes of the gnomes. Okay, which what's that? are trolls. <gasps> oh. So I'm not going to go into trolls too much. Um, humankind often will conflate gnomes and trolls because we just don't know any better. We'll save that for another episode. Definitely. But trolls are trolls are known for our rolling into gnome villages, oh, no. breaking, breaking their little gnome shop windows, <sighs> uh, leaving lit turds on their gnome doorsteps. No! That sort of thing. Oh, that's terrible! But in Siberia... The Siberian gnomes and the Siberian trolls get a lot, uh, or have a lot more in common. They get along a lot better and they interbreed, in fact, to the point where there really isn't a whole lot of difference between a Siberian gnome and a Siberian troll. They're bigger, burlier, 
a little meaner. They like to play nasty pranks. Um, I bet they're pretty hairy to have to live in that climate. Oh, certainly. If if not hairy, then they they gather up like sheep's wool that they steal from farms. And oh things my gosh, like that. cheeky little babies! Mm-hmm. Wow. Um. So something something else I wanted to know was why do humans put garden gnomes around our houses? Is, is that something that that the real gnomes kind of feel honored by, or or is it just kind of a weird sort of? There's a lot of mixture as far as to why it happened it seems like it first started happening in germany um they first started to look at a gnome in the garden as a sign of good luck or prosperity because if you do have gnomes in your garden Uh real gnomes then they are you know pruning your petunias and making sure that your rosemary bush isn't taking over the whole place and things like that um so they're taking good care of your garden with you uh So the the sort of gnome effigy is a sign of honor. Okay, good. Which it seems like the gnomes take positively. Another thing is gnomes are magical creatures. They have magic. And part of what they use that magic for is to hide themselves in plain sight. Oh, wow. So it's likely that gnomes sort of saw this as a really easy way of getting to live in someone's garden without being really noticed. They can make themselves as still as a statue during the day, and uh, at night they go and romp and play. And in fact, especially in North America, the the gnomes of North America, you might have one in your garden and you wouldn't know because they masquerade as statues. Um, And you could be buying, you could be going to like a garden center, buying a, a garden gnome, putting it in your yard, not knowing that it was in fact a real gnome. Oh my gosh, that is definitely something that we will have to keep in mind when we're moving into a a place with an actual gr- garden with you know soil and. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm thinking the the ones we have are definitely statues because if they mm. were real gnomes, they would have left a long time ago. Yeah, probably so. I think it's really cool that they try to live amongst us. I um, I'm I'm flattered on on behalf of mm-hmm. the human race. I am flattered. Me too. I <laughs> I like knowing that there could be uh. Just a little pointy hat boy running around somewhere nearby. Yes. yes. So, from what I have gathered about what you have uh, educated us all about, some of the best ways of befriending a gnome are you want to you wanna feed them good food and drink. That's right. And particularly um, if you're looking to invite or keep a Tomtonisa in your home, their favorite food is warm porridge with butter. So if you can put out a, a bowl of warm porridge with butter at night, uh, just before you go to sleep, think of it as like the milk and cookies for Santa sort of oh, thing. Oh, okay. You'll have a very happy Tomty in your house, and you'll find that it's uh, kept in much better shape uh, if you continue to do so. Good to know. Well, gosh, we're going to have to stock up on some porridge. I'm certainly not eating it. <laughs> it's not for you. Well, no, it isn't. <laughs> All right. Uh, another thing, another couple of things I wanted to talk about is if you want to befriend a gnome out in the wild, uh, whether it's the wild of your garden or out in the forest or even in a cave, you got to respect its space. Now, that's easy enough to do in your garden because you're already trying to keep it nice. Mm-hmm. But you're going to want to do things like not make a lot of noise, um, speak gently and non-threateningly, watch where you step, make sure you're not like kicking mushrooms or things like that. You know, right. turning rocks, um, being a, being a good guest in their space, and then kind of making making your present constant and non threatening. Okay. Then they start to come out and talk to you, um, playing to their interests. Gnomes like music, good food and drink, like we talked about. Uh, pipe smoking. Do they have tiny instruments? They do. They oh. do. They play little. Little stringed instruments, little drums, little little flutes made out of twigs. Oh, how sweet. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. They make joyous gnome music. So if you can make sort of light, airy, non-threatening sounds with a, a pan flute or finger cymbals or something like that, I'm okay. sure that would ingratiate you towards them. Uh, another thing that you don't want to do, which is very unfortunate for us, is if you're wanting to invite a gnome into your home or your garden... 
Uh, unfortunately, cat owners, it's, it's just not going to happen. Gnomes oh, are yeah. very afraid of cats because cats, they like to they like to chase and play and bap at little things that oh, run no. through the garden. <laughs> yes, we, the, we know about that. And most of the cats don't mean any harm. We have a cat that might mean some harm. But, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a distressing experience for a gnome to wander into a garden and then be chased all about by a, a furry kitty. Well, sure. So, unfortunately, if you have a cat... Um, don't expect a, don't really expect a gnome to come into your garden or home. Keep them, yeah, keep them indoors for many reasons, Mm -hmm. but, uh, especially so that we can attract more, more sweet gnomes. Definitely. And then the last sort of thing I wanted to talk about as far as befriending a gnome is in regards to the Siberian gnome. Mm -hmm. While all of these things that I mentioned would probably help not make a Siberian gnome angry because they are pretty vengeful, vindictive, uh, (laughs) It's hard to say what would make a Siberian gnome like you. My best guess, my best suggestion, would be to offer to uh, prank someone with it. Like, say, hey, I've got this uh, I've got this whoopee cushion. You want to go to town? Really? Uh, I'm not saying that it'll guarantee that they'll want to hang out with you or be friends with you. But it's better than nothing. Right, they're little, little mischief makers. Okay. It's true. Interesting. Okay, so. So we have devised a rating system for sort of the ease of which you can become friends with these uh, beings and creatures, uh, given the information we were able to find with them. It's four tiers. Um, Do you want to start? Sure. So the first level of um, friendliness is friend-shaped. That means that this creature is easy to befriend, with little risk to your health and well-being, they um, they are compassionate, kind. They um, they don't want to hurt you in general. Um, what's the next one? The next one is cheeky friend. Uh, they're a little more difficult to become friends with, and even when you do finally make that friendship, you're gonna find that they are gonna provide a little more irritation, mischief in your life, um, sort of. Getting, getting up in your grill without harming you, really. Right. Okay. So the next one is spicy friend. This means that this creature would be a bit more challenging to befriend. They're, they're somewhat dangerous. You, you might run the risk of harming yourself or even, even beefing it. Beefing it. <laughs> um, if you're not careful. So, um, that's uh that's the third level and then and then the fourth level is not a friend yet now this is a sort of creature being where there have not been any recorded cases of humans becoming friends with this creature and in most cases contact with this creature results in severe injury or death right so for for gnomes my rating would be friend shaped. I I would definitely say I might be a little biased because as we talked about, we um <laughs> we we really have a thing for gnomes. Um now the sub Siberian gnomes for sure are a bit more of a, a cheeky friend. They're little pranksters. I'd have to agree with you. Yeah, I, I really feel that they're friend shaped. Especially um especially the Tomtonisa. When you think of something that is friend shaped, don't you think of something that's very small yeah. with um, sort of exaggerated features that is serene and friendly and might get up to a little nonsense, but for the most part is sort of a good part of your life. I would really like to cuddle a Tom Denisa. I'm not sure how they are about contact. I couldn't really find anything about um, physical contact with them. It seems like they do like their personal space. Sure. But certainly you could... Um, you know, find a, make a little gnome bed for them on the hearth of your fireplace. Yes, something to remember with all animals, big or small, fantastical or common, is to respect their boundaries and only cuddle if it's consensual. It's true. Consent (laughs) is very important. Consent is important. So, Vince, I know that, you know, it, it might be a little more difficult for us with a, um, a second story apartment living in suburbia to come across a real life gnome. So it might take us a little bit of time. So in the meantime, I got you this little friend. Oh, 
for those of you who don't have uh, true sight or telepathy, <laughs> uh, Claire just handed me a very small gnome figurine. He has a green tunic, brown belt, uh, sort of grayish shoes, and of course a tall red hat. You have to have the hat. Gotta have the hat. And he is very friendly and very happy to see me. And uh, this will make a wonderful addition to the gnome treasures Aww. that we share with each other. <laughs> it might even go on your desk and watch watch you as you work. I'd be happy about that. <laughs> so if you have any, any questions about gnomes or more information about them, or you want to hear us talking about befriending your favorite magical creature, give us an email at friendsoflegend at gmail.com. Again, that's friendsoflegend, all one word, at gmail.com. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe to our podcast for much more legend talk to come. Yes, and tell your friends. We can't wait for for humankind to live harmoniously with all of the creatures of the world. I agree with that. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, when it comes to friends of legend, charm them. Do not harm them. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.